The swish pattern is one of the most powerful NLP techniques because of its simplicity and effectiveness. But despite its popularity, most people don't know how to do it correctly, which means you're not reaping the true benefits that you could from this process. For the first several NLP trainings that I took with world-renowned teachers, they surprisingly taught it incorrectly. Consequently, I couldn't make it work. And because I couldn't make it work, I didn't use it for years. So in this video, I'm going to teach you the correct way to perform the swish pattern so that you can transform your mind and take a leap closer to being your ideal you. Not only will you learn how to do it correctly, but you also discover why most world-renowned NLP teachers teach it incorrectly. So if you're ready to master the swish pattern and transform your mind, then let's get started. Now, like I have been saying uh, previously, and I'm sure, let's see, yep, plenty of you have <laughs> already jumped onto it. Uh, if you would, knowing that you're live with me right now, please type live in the chat. And then later, if you are in, in fact watching this as a replay, meaning not what I'm doing it live, please type into the comment section that you're watching the replay. Really appreciate that. It helps us in optimizing this content for you, the viewer. Okay, so how did this all happen for me? So I'm, I'm taking these NLP trainings in every NLP tr training that I'm taking, they teach the swish pattern. I had seen the swish pattern done before. The earliest memory I have of the swish pattern was when my dad had bought Tony Robbins course. I think it was called Personal Power. It was back in the late 80s, I want to I want to say. And I got my hands on the course. He didn't ask he didn't tell me I should listen to it or it was all on cons cassette tapes. I just took the initiative and started listening to the tapes. And they talk, he talked about this thing called a swish pattern. Now, looking back on it, he taught it wrong as well. <laughs> but anyway, so flat, uh, jump forward several years, and I'm taking my first NLP trainings, and they keep teaching this pattern. And when I try to use it, it doesn't work. Like the next day, whatever I created was gone. And this is a common complaint you'll hear in NLP. Well, like I tried it or whatever process it is. I tried this process and it seemed to work whenever I was practicing it. But the next day or the week, a week later, it was gone or whatever changes I got from it were gone. It didn't work anymore. And I kept having that same experience with the switch pattern. And so I just put it on the shelf and I thought, okay, for whatever reason, I, I seem to be able to make a lot of NLP work and do it effectively on myself and with other people. But for some reason, the swish pattern just doesn't seem to work. A few years later, I encountered Steve Andreas. That's another story for another time. And eventually, as he was mentoring me, he got to a point where he, was, he couldn't really keep up with my questions because I was asking so many. And he got a sense of what I was actually searching for. And when he said that, he's like, I think I know what you're looking for. I was like, well, good. At least one of us does. And he said, I created this model called the self-concept model. Go read the book, Transforming Yourself, the book that I wrote where I detail that model. And as you're working through it, do all of the exercises. If you have any trouble, let me know. In the introduction, he talks about the swish pattern. And then later he brings it up again. And he starts saying things about it that... I've never heard of. And I was like, wait a minute. I, you know, I got on, I got pulled up a fresh new email and I said, Steve, what are you talking about in the book? These things that you're talking about with the swish pattern, I've never heard of this. How would you even do that? And he came back and said, how, how were you taught this? And I like, so I explained how, and he was like, he knew who my teachers were up to this point. And he was very, very surprised 
And he's like, you sure you're not getting this wrong? You're, you're, they taught it to you this way. And I said, let me go grab my manuals. Uh, Cause I kept all of my manuals from all of my NLP trainings. I went and I grabbed my manuals and in every one of them, it was taught in a similar way, which was what he was calling incorrect. And I took pictures of it and I sent it to him and I was like, this is what, what they're teaching. And so now he realized it wasn't an issue of, did I get it wrong? He was like, okay, now I realize you were taught wrong. And that kind of shook me up a little bit because I was like, okay, I spent a lot of money on these trainings and these are world renowned teachers. And you're saying that they're wrong. I was a little skeptical of him at that point. Still, he was still, he was mentoring me, but it was still pretty fresh and new. And then he began to explain in more depth why it was wrong, what they were teaching and why it needed to be the way that he was mentioning it, which was not something he had made up. This was what he had modeled from, from Richard Bandler. Uh, there's a little, Richard Bandler would claim, would claim, uh, credit for creating the switch pattern, but there's other developers who were involved who claim that they helped him create it. So I'm not going to get into all that, but what Steve was taught directly from Bandler, and this is what he got. This is what he took away from what Bandler was teaching. So it's not like he just made up his own style and then called it right. And then told everyone else they taught it wrong. That's not how it worked. He was actually modeling Richard Bandler when he would do this process. And then later, this was the process that inspired Steve to create the self-concept model, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, later. So Steve told me to go ahead and give it a try, doing it the way that he explained it. And I did. And the difference was profound. I couldn't believe that with just a few really simple changes, it made all the difference, it made a huge difference. And so now I do count it in my toolkit. It's not just sitting on the shelf <laughs> collecting dust. I use it for myself and I use it for my clients because it is very simple and it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily effective because, and most people don't know this, even seasoned NL, NLP practitioners, most people don't understand that when you do this, the switch pattern correctly, you are actually doing a piece of identity work. You are transforming at the identity level. This is why it's so profound, but it has to be done correctly. If you don't do it correctly, it, is, it won't affect your identity. And we want it to. Why? Because your identity is the biggest concept you are carrying around. When you make a change at the identity level, it has profound implications because you are the biggest generalization you make. You take you everywhere you go. So it's not like just a behavioral change in a certain context, which would only be a change in that particular context and only with that particular behavior, it actually shifts who you are. And so that will have an effect in any context and with any behavior. So the theory behind the swish pattern is we start with a behavior that feels very compulsive, a habit, something you don't want to do anymore. Now we can get creative and we don't have to limit it to just a, a compulsive pattern or a habit. You can use a switch pattern for many things. There's no limitation on it. There's no, uh, you can't use it for X, Y, Z because there's going to be some sort of harmful side effects. There's no such thing. So you can experiment, feel free to experiment, but in general, the switch pattern is used for bad habits or compulsions like smoking or overeating, or you could even use it for fear. If you experience a lot of fear in certain situations, though, the fast phobia process might be also a, a better process to use for fear or anxiety. So you have a pattern that you don't like that's getting in your way. That's causing you some problems. And the idea behind the swish pattern is you interrupt that pattern and hijack that pattern, so to speak, with your ideal self, who you ideally want to be. And so you, the pattern begins to play itself out. And what you do is you program a trigger into there to shift the focus of that pattern to 
instead of going into the destructive pattern or the, the destructive habit will then shift you in the direction of becoming who you ideally want to be in every way, your highest ideals, not just shifting. Oh, I'd rather go do something, a different behavior. It actually shifts using your ideal self as a way to then guide your behavior, any behavior that is available to you at that particular time. And this creates that versatility that we're looking for. So it is a piece of identity work. It interrupts the pattern of behavior you don't want to do and then moves it in the direction of becoming who you want to be so that whatever behaviors you have access to in that moment align to that ideal you. And this becomes even more powerful once it becomes unconscious. So people ask me, hey, how often should I practice this wish pattern? And my first question is, uh, for the same habit, you should only practice it a number of times right when you do it and then let it go. It's not something you want to practice every single day because you don't want it to be conscious. Why do I not want it to be conscious? Because when it comes to making choices that involve maybe short-term gratification versus doing something that might take more investment and becoming my ideal self. The, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it happens sometimes. All right. Give me a second. Ah, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back through uh, as I explain this. So that's the theory behind how the, oh, I know what it was. It was uh, not practicing it. So when it comes to short-term gratification, I want this process to be automatic. So I'm not negotiating with myself every single time I'm tempted. Okay, so if it's about, let's say, overeating or smoking a cigarette or something like that, I want the pattern to be interrupted and redirected without it ever getting into my conscious, my consciousness. Now, why? Well, because if it reaches my conscious mind, now I might get, I might start negotiating with myself or I might start saying, well, you know, maybe I can do it this one time because I haven't smoked in a while or I haven't eaten in, overeaten in a while. So maybe I'll go ahead and indulge in it. So if it reaches my conscious mind, now I can then start negotiating with myself and then maybe I find an excuse and go and do it anyway. That's why we don't want to make it conscious or we want to, we have to make it conscious to practice it. And then we let it slip into unconsciousness and that makes it stronger. Because again, like I said, I'm not negotiating with it anymore. I'll give you another example of what I mean by slipping into unconsciousness. Sometimes people will come to me and we'll cover this topic as well in one of these lives. Some people, sometimes people come to me and say, you know, I don't have the willpower I need and the discipline I need to accomplish what I want. Can you help me? And then I'll say, do you brush your teeth? <laughs> and the person will be like, well, yeah. You know, like, what does that have to do with anything? And then I'll say, do you do the, do you brush your teeth every day? And they're like, yeah, of course I do. And I'll say day and night, like morning and night. And I'll say, yes. And I say, for how long? How long have you been doing that? And I'll be like, well, ever since I had teeth, ever since I was a kid. And I'll say, well, where did you ever get the willpower and the discipline to do that every single day for so many years? You know, nothing's perfect. Of course, you skip every now and then. But in general, you know, how, where would you get the willpower to do that and the, the self-discipline to do that? And the person will go, well, I never even thought about it that way. I just do it. Exactly. You have decided you want clean teeth. You have decided you want fresh smelling breath. You have decided you don't want to lose your teeth prematurely as you get older. All of this has been decided. There is no more negotiating about it. So you simply do it. And you don't have a sense of it taking willpower and discipline to do it. You just simply do it. And that's where you want to get to with the swish pattern. When you're breaking a compulsive pattern or you're intervening in it and redirecting it to your ideal self, you want this to be unconscious, just like brushing your teeth is unconscious. 
you've already decided this is who you want to be. You want to be this ideal version of yourself. And you don't even have to think about it. It all happens unconsciously. Therefore, you don't in engage in a destructive habit. You go toward a better behavior that lines up with your ideal self. So that's the theory behind it. After losing my train of thought. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go through the process. But here's the thing. I just want you to l just listen to me. Because the I don't, you don't need to take notes because the entire process is in the description of this video. It's on a PDF. You can just download the PDF. All of the instructions are there. In fact, all of the instructions are there in a more precise way that I'm going to give you here. But I am going to run through them so you have an overall understanding of them. And when you do decide to use the switch pattern, I highly recommend you use that PDF. And you can come back to this video and just listen to everything that I'm saying here so that you know, you understand uh, not just not only how to use it correctly and do it correctly, but you understand the theory behind it. So you understand what it is we're really doing here, which is going to help you a lot. It'll, make, it'll help you make this process more effective. So what happens for the, what we do for the switch pattern is you want to think about something that you feel a compulsion to do. And once you get started, it's like you can't stop yourself. So that could be overeating, that could be smoking, uh, that could even be arguing politics with people. I've caught myself doing that. Uh, anything that you feel compelled to do once you get going doing it, and then afterward you go, ah, I wish I hadn't have done that. I don't want to do that anymore. That's not healthy. That's not good for me. Now, like I said, if you want to get more creative with the switch pattern and use it for other things, have at it. The sky is the limit. Try any, try the switch pattern, try a variety of ways of using it with a variety of things that you'd like to change. There's no harmful side effects, so go for it. But I would start with the original way to use it because that'll make it easier for you to understand it. And then once you have a grasp of it and you understand it, it's so much easier than to experiment and play around with it. So if you were to think of something that is very compulsive that you do, that you want to change, and you want to identify what it is, and most, most of you are visual. I understand that not all of you are very visual. So this can be done auditorily. The first thing you want to recognize is what is happening. What happens at that, that trigger point, the point of no return, the point at which you go, okay, I'm going to have that cigarette or, okay, I'm going to binge eat or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. There is a moment at which there seems to be a point of no return. Now I'll use as an example, I don't smoke, but I'll use smoking as an example. I've worked with smokers before and say, okay, what is that moment like when you know that you're getting a cigarette and there's no, there's a point of no return. And either the person would see a cigarette in front of them or they would see it in their mind. So it doesn't matter which it is. So the compulsion that you might be working with could be something that you're actually seeing in person but we can also make a representation of it in our minds and the same thing happens. We go, oh, it'd be great to have a cigarette right now, even though there's not a cigarette even around. It's just, you, you see that image in your head and it makes you compelled to do it. So we wanna know what is that image? Now, in most cases, there's always exceptions, but in most cases, that is going to be a very associated image. Now we talked about association before, but I know if you're on this live, you might be on my lives for the first time. So. Associated means when you're actually, it's like you're there, point of view, perspective, living out either a memory or an imagined experience. So if I see the cigarette, it means I feel like I'm there in person, point of view, perspective, my hands are in front of me, I see the cigarette, and that's what it feels like. And there's probably not a whole lot else that I can see. My peripheral vision is narrowed to that cigarette. And that's likely how a compulsive trigger image starts very associated and you don't see much else but the thing that's tempting you you get the same thing for food you know like if you saw a certain food or you saw the food in your mind and that would make you very focused on that and as if you're actually there so we know that compulsion usually has a very associated feel to it like you're actually there even though you might not be and so we want to find what is it that's that point that 
pivot point where you're going for this thing and there's no stopping you. So, and you will probably kind of feel it when you access that image. Now this, you can do this with sound, you can do this with auditory, but most people, even if they're very auditory, still see this as an image and you can combine the two as well. So that's the point that I know I want to interrupt that. I want to interrupt that because I, I know that if I can interrupt that and replace it with something better, then I won't have the cigarette or I won't binge eat, that I'll, I'll, I'll stop. So you, it's really important to find that exact moment, whatever that is that puts you over the edge. Okay, and so that's one image. All right, once you locate that, then I'm gonna set that to the side. The next image I wanna create is an ideal image of myself. Okay, now the instructions I give you is, I'm about to give you is really, really important. This is where most people get it wrong. You wanna see an ideal image of yourself in no particular context and not doing any particular behavior. Now this is the part where people get stumped. First of all, they say, well, how do I do that? They have a hard time imagining themselves, the ideal image of themselves, not doing anything in particular and not in any particular context. And this is often where it gets taught wrong because it's not the easiest thing for most people to create an ideal image of yourself without doing any particular behavior and without being in, in, in any particular context. Most people, when you say, make an ideal image of yourself, they see themselves doing something that they would ideally like to do. And they see themselves in a place where they would ideally like to be. So for example, <laughs> Say the person you're working with is a smoker and they want to not smoke anymore. And you say, make an ideal image of yourself, what you would rather be or who you would rather be than smoking a cigarette. And they might see themselves being muscle bound and tan on a beach in Hawaii, lifting weights or maybe swimming or something like that. And you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's not, it's not that there's anything wrong in particular with that. But when you talk about beach, which is a particular context, and you're working out or you're swimming or whatever, those are particular behaviors. And we call this content. The NLP and especially the swish pattern works on process and structure. And that's what makes it very powerful. That's what makes NLP very powerful. We stay away from content as much as possible and we work in structure and process. So here's the problem with that. Yes, uh, I don't know anyone who wouldn't like being on a beach in Hawaii uh, and enjoying yourself, either being healthy you know, by swimming or working out. Of course, we all want that. However, how likely is it that you're going to be able to do that every time you want a cigarette? So for example, if I do the swish pattern this way and I create an image, like I mentioned, being in Hawaii and being all healthy and swimming and exercising and everything, and that's what I use as my ideal image. And this is what we go and we swish. I start off with that trigger image of me being compulsed to compulsed to get a cigarette. And then I swish that with this ideal image of myself on the beach and exercising and not smoking. And I keep swishing that. And I keep practicing that because this is how the swish pattern works. Then what happens when I want a cigarette at three in the morning? I wake up and I go, ah. Oh, I want a cigarette and you know i see that image of a point of view perspective and i see that cigarette and then suddenly this image of me being on, in hawaii swishes up and i'm all tan and healthy and i'm exercising do you think that that's going to interrupt the pattern of me wanting a cigarette temporarily yes however hawaii and the beach and exercise at three in the morning is not available to me so guess what I just broke my swish pattern. It's not going to work. I can't access the, my ideal self unless I'm in Hawaii and, you know, tan and exercising. So what's the next best thing? Well, the cigarette's the next best thing. So the swish had all this content in it. Couldn't connect with it. Not at three in the morning in California. Gone. You go, you revert back to the cigarette. <clears throat> so most 
most of the time when I was, well, every time I was taught the swish pattern, I was taught, and this is the way most people are using it, to create an ideal image of myself doing something, a behavior I would rather do than the compulsion behavior, the habitual behavior, and being someplace I would rather be than where I was, wherever that was, that I was seeing the compulsion image. So it is imperative that your ideal self is an image of you, I think from head to shoulders would probably be good. You can do more if you want, but head and shoulders is probably about what you want. And you're not in any particular behavior, so you could see like a black screen behind you or a green screen behind you. It can, the color doesn't really matter. It can be any color, but not in any particular place, like a beach or a gym or anything like that. You just see yourself from head to shoulders and whatever it is, there's something about you in that image that communicates to you that this is the you who has solved all of your problems and is living your ideal life. And that might take you some time to create, but it's absolutely worth doing it. And just having that ideal image of yourself is very powerful even if you don't use it for a switch pattern. But I, you might as well, because it's very effective. So take that time and create that ideal image of yourself. Not right now, because I'm going to keep talking. But when you go to do this pattern, make sure you do that. And it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, you can add to it later. You can enhance it, embellish it. You can add things to it later. Just do not put behavior in it and don't put a particular location. If you do that, whatever, whatever you're swishing from, whatever that habit is, if you swish an ideal image of yourself doing a particular behavior and in a particular location, and that behavior and that location is not available to you in that moment, it's going to destroy your swish pattern and you're going to revert back to whatever the habit is. And that's defeats the whole purpose of doing the swish pattern. So you do the swish pattern with that ideal image of yourself. And once you swish it, you practice, you want to practice that about seven to 10 times. You want to practice swishing it about seven, 10, the seven to 10 times. So you put that compulsory image here. Did I say compulsory? I think that's wrong. Compulsion image here, your ideal image below it. And then you swish it up, making the ideal image bigger and expand so that it takes up all of your view and shrink the other visual down to nothing. Now you can get creative with that. You don't have to do it exactly that way. Some people put the ideal image in the corner of the compulsion image, and then they have it just expand and grow. Uh, I've played around with throwing my ideal image out into the, like, the space and then have it come and slam into the compulsion image and destroy it, like maybe like the Star Wars explosion. Make it fun. So you can get creative like that. Just whatever works for swishing this. And then as you practice it seven to 10 times, it's very, very important. This is the other piece that you, you need to be careful about. Because I'll tell people, don't, you know, be, care be careful of this. And then they'll go, you know, the swish pattern didn't work. And I'll say, why? And they say, well, because it keeps yo-yoing back. And I'm like, I told you, I told you to be careful of this. So you put that compulsion image up front, ideal image at the bottom, you swish. Now, when you go to reset this, just blank out the screen in front of you, you know, your mental screen in front of you. What some people will do is when they, they switch their ideal image up here and they put their habit uh, image down here, then when they go to reset it to rehearse it again, they swish it back up. And so now it's connected to both swishes. It does a reverse swish. So don't do that. So when you swish your ideal image up and your compulsion image down, blank out the screens, refresh your mind, and then start over with the compulsion image here and the ideal image here, and then swish it. So just make sure that the only swish you're rehearsing is the ideal image coming up and the compulsion image going down. Never swish it back the other way when you reset, because if you do, it's going to create that yo-yo effect. So when you're going about life and you have that habitual image shows up, you're going to get that ideal image of yourself and you go, oh, I'm going to go do something else. 
and then suddenly it switches back to the <laughs> compulsion image and then you'll go for whatever that habit is. So why do you think this ideal image of yourself is so powerful? It's because that it lacks the content. So like I said, if you have specific content, like going to the gym or something like that, and that is not available to you because it's like three in the morning or something like that, that ideal image of yourself being content free and context free gives you the space and the ability to connect with any behaviors that are available to you, no matter what context you're in, because you're connecting and aligning with your ideal self. And because it has no content attached to it, you have the freedom and the ability to find a behavior that is available to you in the context, whatever context you may be in at that time. That's what makes it so powerful. Unfortunately, that's not how it's often taught. So make sure that your ideal image is content free other than an image of yourself, your ideal self. And so I think it's because not many even world renowned teachers understood that that they would say, oh yeah, you know, just attach whatever behaviors you want. And, you know, and, and naturally people tend to see themselves in a particular context and they didn't teach it correctly. They didn't understand it themselves. Okay. And just make sure that you avoid the mistake of the yo-yo swish where it goes back and forth. So my mentor, Steve Andreas, uh, he was famous for uh, correcting other trainers. And when he saw that uh, I had gotten this wrong, he got inspired and he went <laughs> onto YouTube and found other teachers teaching the swish pattern. And then he would start commenting under their videos saying, you're teaching this wrong. Because he, he realized that if I had learned it incorrectly and he knew who my teachers were, he, was, he thought there's probably a lot of people who are teaching this incorrectly. So he went around finding people uh, on YouTube and uh, on blogs teaching it incorrectly, and then he would go and correct them, and they did not like that. He didn't, tended to not care too much about that either. He didn't didn't make a lot of friends that way. But thankfully, there was someone like Steve who would make those corrections, and I found this extremely useful, and this was one of the reasons it, en it endeared me to him as a, a mentee. I realized that he understood things that a lot of people were not teaching, and... I wanted to know what those things were because I, I hit a plateau in my own NLP development and my personal growth because I was using processes and techniques that had content imposed on it. And then Steve was able to come around and, and explain that to me and show, show me why that was a problem. And then I was able to correct it. If you can do a correct swish pattern, that will put you way ahead of most <laughs> NLP st students. And you'll be able to do something that seems almost miraculous when it works. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It's so simple and it just works so effectively. All right, in conclusion, I never could get the swish pattern to work consistently until I made these corrections that I just gave you. Now it works incredibly well anytime I use it on myself or with clients. This pattern is great for people just starting to learn NLP, and it's also great for practitioners who wanna go deeper into belief and identity work. The Swish pattern was what inspired Steve Andreas, my mentor, to create the most powerful NLP model there is, the self-concept model. And if I had to do it all over again, if I had to start my NLP training, my NLP journey all over again, this is one of the patterns, the switch pattern would be one that I would have started practicing, experiencing and understanding. And that's what I recommend to you. Really practice, understand this pattern, experience it. Experience and understand how simple yet powerful this process works and how it can then lead you to understanding how to transform yourself at the identity level. This is one of the processes we do focus on in teaching people the self-concept model and training our, our coaches especially to understand what was the inspiration for it. And then just from 
that simple process, how it has turned into a complete model of identity and how to transform yourself at the identity level. All right. Before we go, if you would, think about what your big takeaway has, from this has been. And when you put it into words, it really makes a difference. It helps you remember it. It helps it create more meaning for you. And when you think about that, when you can write that out, write it out in the comments here. I love reading what your big takeaways. Sometimes I read your big takeaways and I go, oh man, I should have clarified this more. <laughs> and sometimes I read them and I go, wow, okay, this person really, really got it. I can't wait to see what happens for this person. I want to hear back from this person because based on what they wrote here, they really understood what I was talking about. So I love reading your comments and it does help me as a teacher, uh, especially when it comes to trying to explain and teach this even better. I'm always wanting to get better. So your comments really help me do that. All right, speaking of comments, let me see if I have any questions here that I can answer. Let's see. Yes, I've had that happen to me with so many NLP techniques. I had assumed they just didn't work. I've been persisting and things are beginning to click. Good for you. Swish pattern, AKA fast self console. <laughs> awesome. Hope the ribs are okay. Yeah, they're getting better. It's, it's a slow process, but yes, they're healing. Does it get rid of limiting beliefs? It can, it can. Uh, it's not the most direct way to, to focus on overcoming limiting beliefs, but your ideal self is a belief. Your ideals are beliefs in a sense, they're generalizations. So it will guide your behavior in a way that aligns with your ideals. And so, like I said, that's very powerful. How do you know when it becomes unconscious? Because you don't think about it anymore. And when you're in the real world and that trigger image happens, you just, you don't even know it. You just go and do something else. And what you, so what it, the, the feeling will be more like, wow, it's been all day and I haven't had a cigarette or it's been all day and I haven't splurged or binged, you know, on eating or you realize you're not doing the habit anymore. And so what that tells you is that you probably had several opportunities or there was, you were tempted, but only for a split, split second and your ideal image came in as you rehearsed it and interrupted the pattern and led you toward choosing something better for you. So it's kind of like in retrospect, you go, wow, you know, I haven't, I haven't been doing this thing anymore. Got to love it. I lose my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Never been able to successfully implement the switch pattern. Perhaps I didn't fully under understand what it was supposed to accomplish. Okay. Well, hopefully you, now you do. So make sure you get that, um, that PDF that's in the description of this video. I cannot use this phone. Okay. Use with hesitation and procrastination. Yeah, give it a try. There's no harm in, in trying it out on just about anything. I see an image of me being happy, fun, and somewhat sophisticated. Okay, so as long as you're not seeing you do any particular behaviors or in and being in any particular con context, that's all fine. I vomit every couple of days. It always happens after eating. Uh, I would go to the doctor for that. Let's see. Love to learn more about Swish live, but we'll watch replay early in Australia. Okay. You're explaining the swish in detail. Do I do I get it finally? It sounds like you're that's a statement. Okay, good. Procrastination procrastination doesn't have an image really. Um think about the last time you procrastinated. And what you'll probably find is that there's a a common a commonality to it, a common image. Point of no return for anger is not a visual thing, so how to handle that? Hard to stop with far left liberals enough. Okay. So you're talking to the wrong person. If you're going <laughs> to come after, uh, liberals, uh, but what I will give you is, so you're, when you say anger and you don't have any visual to go with it, uh, I disagree. Um, what's happening for you is you're, you're more focused on the feeling than what it is that is causing the feeling. So we don't just have random feelings, uh, like anger or, or even sadness or love or any of these things we think we think we do 
because your feelings are what becomes conscious. When you feel something, you're usually consciously aware that you're feeling something. What you haven't, what you weren't consciously aware of is what you were seeing or hearing either externally or just happening in your own mind that then caused that feeling. So feelings don't just happen randomly. So I could be going about my everyday life and I hear someone who I'm not even talking to, maybe just someone on the street say something. And then my mind unconsciously starts doing its stream of consciousness, free associating that word to something else, to something else that reminds me of say an ex-girlfriend or something like that. And suddenly I'm angry. I don't know how I got here. I'm conscious that I'm feeling anger, but what I wasn't conscious of is the stream of consciousness processing that led up to it because that was all unconscious. However, I can access that by tracing from the feeling back to its origin. Where did this come from? Now that takes a little time and you get quiet with yourself like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it will get. And then you trace that back. What started this feeling? And there's your compulsion image. So you can interrupt your anger, say, okay, when an Im such an image comes up, I know that anger doesn't help me in this situation. And the situation may be different every single time. So that would determine what would be the most useful behavior. So I'm not going to swish to a specific behavior. I'm going to swish to my ideal self and trust that when I'm being my ideal self and I'm moving toward that, that I will find useful behaviors in that whatever context I'm in. How to change beliefs. Uh, we already did a live on that. So go back to the live um, that I did on that, on changing beliefs. So we don't need to have the how or solution or see ourselves doing a particular replacement task, primarily just a generalized outcome or vision of, of your ideal self. Yes, for all the reasons that I just explained. You don't know where you're going to be and what will be available to you when you experience that compulsion every single time. There's just no way. So you want to trust in your ideal self, the, the you who's going to align with your highest ideals will find the right behavior that's available in the moment. And that's why this works so incredibly well. If you give it a, spe a specific behavior in a specific context, the only way the switch will work is when you're in that specific context and that behavior is available to you. Well, I smoke too heavily and I reckon he makes sense. No, 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 no worries. I'm on it. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching live the last part, but I will catch. Okay. So can NLP be the art of conversation with your mind? Uh, it's so much more than that. And it's both art and science. It uses both. Uh, so I would call it a technology. Do you think swish pattern would help with reflux? I've been taking meds for it, but only reduces it, not fixing it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to try. Give it a try. I don't know if it will or not. Holy crap, I've got it at last. Oh my, <laughs> okay, that's good. See, I'm having problems with my phone. Okay, it sounds like you are using your mind's eye. Sure, if you want to call it that, that's a it's a metaphor. I found it easy to not re-swish back to my compulsion by shattering it with my ideal image. Okay. Shannon says, I love this. Did something similar with something else. This is a better way in doing it. Yo-yoing is not ideal. Thanks for the lesson. You're welcome. The swish work if you want to reduce the compulsion but not totally eliminate it. Um, well, here's what I would say about that. Uh, you don't, I don't think you should want to hold on to a compulsion. What I would say about that is, what, is a, what, is a, what does a compulsion imply? It, it, complies, it, in, it complies, it implies that you don't have a choice, right? If I'm compulsed to do something, it's sort of like I've lost my ability to choose. So I would reframe what you're saying as can I, how about I eliminate the compulsion, which the switch pattern will do. And then I can make a, a choice as to whether or not I want to indulge in that thing or not. Right. Cause yeah, you might, you might want to, uh, you know, if you, or generally healthy and you exercise a lot and you mostly eat healthy food, you might want to splurge once or twice a week and there's nothing wrong with that, but you wanted the choice to do it. You don't want to feel like you have to. So use this wish pattern to get rid of the compulsion and then put yourself in a situation where I'm going to choose 
to reward myself with a little bit of splurging and whatever that might be. So come from a place of choice, not compulsion. I actually got chills when I pictured my not so ideal self and ideal self. I have peaky blinders, body language. Okay. <laughs> How soon does it work? It should work immediately. So you want to test it and that's in the instructions. So you rehearse it, then you test it, and then you go out in the real world and see if it works. And then if it doesn't, you can always practice it again and see if there was any problems that uh, you had in doing the process the first time. Big takeaway for Swish, unspecified background image of ideal self not engaging in any particular behavior. Good. You hit the two big mistakes I made using Swish. I'll need to think more on how to do the ideal picture and not quite understanding that yet. Uh, it takes some time, but once you have it, it's pretty amazing to see an ideal image of yourself, the ideal you. Who would that look like? It's it's very powerful and profound. Takeaway, use the Swish pattern for all types of problems. Yeah, give it a try. I'll try to soak it in, drip feed it. Okay. I have to apply the switch pattern to many situations. Good vibes. Okay. Appreciate it so much. Can you actually change repeated behaviors with this that contribute to counterexamples for equality? Of course you can. Switch pattern is a central tool for identity model. Um, I wouldn't say it's, an, it's a central. You can use the self, I think you mean the self-concept model. You don't have to use the switch pattern for the self-concept model, but it uh, understanding how how going how Steve went from that to creating the self-concept model will be its own journey for you and a, and a great one. Uh, following a couple of negative patterns. First, we'll refine my ideal image, which I am nearing completion. Okay, good. How to use the SP, the switch pattern with anger, apathy, and other emotions with not visuals. So if that, if you're saying that because you're a very auditory person, the same thing applies. What is the associated auditory information that you're getting that triggers you. That's what you want to find. So it doesn't have to be an image and you can switch sound because sound has a location. So you can use it auditorily, but I think what you're asking, and I think what a lot of people think is, oh, I, when I have whatever feeling, anger, whatever, there aren't any internal representations for me or external representations that trigger it. And it's just not true. So you need to find what that is. All emotion is a response to you evaluating, responding to some sort of information. And that information can be external or it can be represented internally. But you don't have strong emotions like that randomly for no reason. Something is being represented internally or you're seeing or hearing something uh, externally. And so the key is in finding that, not trying to change the emotion itself. If you try to change the emotion itself, it's not going to work. It's like going to a per to a person who's depressed and trying to cheer them up. It doesn't work. It's like going up to someone who's in a fit of rage and just saying, oh, calm down. And they go, oh, okay, you're right. <laughs> People don't do that. So you have to you have to change what is going on. You have to change the information that's being evaluated that's causing the emotion. Uh, let's see. So do you use the same ideal self image for all compulsion images? Yes. Yes, you do. Because it's, it's neutral. It's, it's, you know, there's no content in it. So you can use it for every swish that you do. Damon, do you use NLP for healing? Like with recent injury? Um, I have, and the truth is I can't tell you for sure if it worked. Cause I don't like, I've never had an injury to my ribs before. So I don't know how long it takes to heal. Uh, in general, I heal pretty quickly. Um, so it's hard to know, but I, I, it's, it certainly doesn't hurt to do that. Uh, let's see. I smoke and I don't want to use that, use, use this for that. Why not? I would, I would, if, if you want to, unless you don't want to quit, <laughs> but if you want to quit smoking, why would you not try it? Take away the aware of the yo-yo effect. Now I see that I have benefited from learning the pattern from you before. I choose more often when to eat unhealthy food and I haven't really linked it to the switch I did years ago, but I have been doing the yo-yo. So now I will try it again. Thank you for a great life. You're welcome. My experience switch only provides choice rather than eliminate compulsion, compulsive behavior, phobia, non-useful behavior patterns. What am I missing? Um, so the switch is not the cure for everything. So you might need to go deeper into what your beliefs are about yourself. And that's when we get into the self-concept model. So the swish pattern is amazing. It's an, it's like a hack. Um, 
and it is a piece of identity work, but it's not going to be as profound and big and detailed and predictable as say using the self-concept model because this self-concept model is all encompassing of your identity and your beliefs about yourself. So a simple technique is not going to replace that. Uh, but that simple technique is what inspired that bigger model. So I would, I would start learning the self-concept model if I were you. So if there is a sensitivity to smell or sound, et cetera, senses and emotions come up like anger and sadness, or are you saying there is something internal going on between the trigger and the feeling? And that's what we address. So if you're talking about, let's say you're triggered by a smell, like, okay, there might just be a smell that you don't like. And if that's all it is, then you just need to get away from that smell, right? But if that smell triggers something inside of you that you don't like, like an angry feeling or something like that, then yeah, you want to know how that's happening. What is it that's causing me to go down that path? And that's the pattern that you would interrupt with an ideal image of yourself so that you can handle the smell, whatever it is, without, I don't know, engaging in really negative feelings and thinking. You know, you can still say, well, I don't like the smell. Okay, fine. Yeah, you don't like the smell, but you probably can bear it or deal with it. Sounds the same thing. So if you just don't like certain sounds, like I'm sound sensitive, I hear sounds and I, I just go, oh, like that's, you know, it's too much for me. It's too intense. That's different than I hear a sound and I get enraged or I hear a, a sound and I get depressed. So if those types of feelings are being triggered, then yeah, you can absolutely use the switch pattern to figure out, okay, you don't have to actually know what's going on. You don't have to go into like somewhere in your deep in your childhood, this thing, you don't have to do that. Sometimes you do, but if you're using the switch pattern, just give it a try and swish it. And then you should be able to like handle that sound. Like I don't like loud sounds, but most of the time I don't get angry about it. Sometimes I do actually, but um, that's not a common response from me. But if it were, I could definitely use a swish pattern on that. And then sometimes they're coming from inside you. <laughs> you think about something and then you get angry, right? You think about something and then you get sad. Okay, well, it's whatever you're representing that you were thinking about. How are you, how are you representing that? You can swish that. I saying there's something internal going on between the trigger and the feeling and the, okay. So I think I, I think I covered that. So what I want to try to do, I want to do, try to do strategies on it. I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, I know what NLP strategies are, but I still don't know how that would connect. Yeah, for example, like smells in the workplace somewhere you need to be for long periods. Okay. So again, if that is triggering you emotionally, then yes, use the switch pattern. If it's just unpleasant and you don't like it, well, that's kind of just what's happening there. You know, it's like, don't know that you can trick your mind into thinking it's pleasant, but yeah, I just want to, I'd want to get away from it if that were the case. All right. I stayed on much longer than I expected, but you guys have really good questions. And this, I know the switch pattern is a very popular technique. I hope that this has helped you understand how to use it well so that it works very effectively for you and make sure you drop lines in the comment the comment section about how it's worked for you or if it hasn't worked for you and you have questions about what you might have done incorrectly or how to troubleshoot it yeah let me know those things i'm very curious about that okay we have a special uh live tomorrow for valentine's day don't worry i won't get too mushy but it does have to do with love if you haven't noticed already, you can see what the upcoming lives are every single uh, for the next day. And so the, that should be out now. And you can also click on it and have YouTube notify you uh, when we're when uh, when I'm going live. OK, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I love sharing this stuff and I just love that you're here for uh, to listen and to take what I'm giving you here and use it in your life to make it better. Take care, everybody.